Hey everybody, I'm just uh, inviting Gary, who is going to be doing his <coughs> live streaming from his telescope tonight. He's got a pretty sweet setup. It's a 14-inch telescope with uh, with a very wide field of view, which is which is really cool. So we'll just give about everyone a chance to show up. Thanks, Gary. Hey, Fraser. Hey, Gary. How's it going? Okay, here. Let me turn the other light on. Sure. Okay. Now I don't look. Uh, now, have you got the the other view? How are you planning to join the? I'm gonna pop that one up right now. Okay. And you've got something in in the field right now. Yeah, Orion. Okay. But I I'm gonna. I'm going to go live with it right now just so people can know this is happening. So Okay. All right? Yep. <clears throat> there we go. Cool. I don't know if anyone's watching yet. People it's uh this is very this was no notice, totally last minute. So hopefully people will realize it's happening. Yeah, understand. Yeah, I may have to run through a calibration of my scope. I ran it back to uh, Orion, and it didn't find it right away. So I have lost my calibration. Why is it not connecting? Like you had, oh, you mean that second instance? Yeah, but this is how I did it the other day. Let me try it again. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah I just saw you a second ago, or it was trying to connect. Okay, yes, I agree. Is that working? There we go. There we go. <clears throat> okay, well let me let me switch to that view. All right. Cool. Okay. So I don't know if anybody is uh is watching yet. Um <clears throat> but we're doing some tests with Gary's telescope. Now, so Gary, where where are you located? In Southern California, um, near um, the Ontario Airport. Right. Okay. San Bernardino area. And my dinner just got here too, so <laughs> oh. I may eat a little bit while I'm talking. Yeah. Uh, well, just remember that the uh, your public is watching. So. Um, <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> right, and so your oh good okay we got a little more color commentary we got John Boise joining us. Um, hey John. Hi there. Can you? Um, hey, how you so, doing? So, and so the your setup is very different from all of the other telescopes that we've run up until now. So, can we kind of explain your telescope? And I think you've even got a, a way to even view your scope, right? Um, yeah, yeah. In fact, I've got uh, right there is my live scope cam. Your live scope cam. How cool is that? Okay, so why don't you explain your setup then? Well, I'm running a. Um, is that. Um, I, sorry, just wanted to see how big it was on the screen. Um, it's a Celestron 14 inch, and I've got uh, the Fast Star assembly, so I'm running at f2. So it's about 675 millimeters. Okay, so that's and that's all super confusing to people. <laughs> now, now when you say the Fast Star setup, what does that mean? Because the way I understand with the Celestron, right? The there Sch these Schmidt Cassegrain telescopes. The they're stubby. They're very short because the way they're they're set up, you've got the the light comes in the front, bounces off the back mirror, comes back out, and then there's another mirror inside, and it bounces off and then comes back out, and the eyepiece is at the back. Unlike a Dobsonian, which are longer, and the light goes down the bottom, comes back up, and then the eyepiece comes out the side. And so, what's what is what have you done when you say you've got a fast star assembly? What is it that you've done? Okay, what it does is on the uh, Schmidt Cassegrain, there's a corrector plate in the front. So it's a lens. And my understanding is that allows them to use a spherical uh, rather than a parabolic reflector. So it basically corrects for that change. Normally, in a, in a um, Dobsonian, you're going to, or a Newtonian, you're going to have a. Um, <sighs> 
uh, para parabolic mirror. Right. So then it does bounce back to a secondary mirror that's in the center of the corrector plate. Secondary mirror is about four inches in diameter. Then it runs back down to the eyepiece at the back of the scope under normal operation. Uh, and what that does is that gives it, the, the whole world is your focal length. And this is a piece that I've learned. Uh, the shorter your focal length, the more area you're going to see. And as you get a bigger scope, it's harder to get the short focal length. But it's uh, 18 to, I think it's about, boy, I grabbed my book, but I think it's about 3,000 millimeters when it's, when you're looking through the back. Right, and this is where I think we've been, we've been talking to people about the focal, about the, the, it's the F ratio. So, so if, in the case of some of the, I'll well, give you an example. Like we've been looking at some other telescopes, and the, and when you get like Jupiter really big in the in the eyepiece, then you've got like an f20 or f28. Sometimes they'll use a Barlow lens that multiplies the view. But in in Gary's case, because of what he's done to his telescope, he's got an f2. So. Um, on, so for, for Gary's telescope, looking at Jupiter, for example, is there's no point. It's this time. Maybe we'll you know we'll take a second and take a look at it at some point. Mm -hmm. But you'll see it's this overexposed, tiny little dot on the on the screen, and so it's just it's of no value at all for looking at at looking at like planetary stuff, which is most of the astronomers we've been dealing with are, are really set up for the planetary observations. So what Gary is set up for is the exact opposite, which is these beautiful wide objects, Andromeda and, uh, you know, uh, the Great Nebula in Orion. And so we're going to be able to see some, some stuff that, that nobody else has been able to show us so far. And I think anyone who's watching this is going to be really, really impressed. So... <clears throat> So that's kind of your setup, and like I said, I mean, astronomers will will get the right, get the kind of gear, and get the sort of kind of the telescope and so on, depending on the kinds of work that they want to do. And Gary is most interested in this deep field astrophotography, and this is what we're what we're looking at. So we've got John Voisey, who's joined us, and stably, I think, at this at this point. Can you wave, John? Are you there? Yes. And then yeah, we've got Roy, and we've got Roy Salisbury. Who is here as well? And now, now I don't know if anyone remembers. Roy was with us uh, probably about a week ago, a week and a half ago, and he was sort of we had our three telescope night. Uh, Roy was in Arizona showing us Jupiter for rock steady the the entire star party, although he kept being uh, threatened to be clouded out. So. Um, so right now tonight everybody's cloudy, but except for Gary, and as you can see, Gary is just gonna knock everybody's socks off. This is, I'm really excited. I've done some demos with Gary, and his setup is just astonishing. So, um, so okay, so Gary, so what are we looking at? This is Orion, and I can look at it different ways. This is a 10 second exposure. Right. So just to be clear, so some of the some of the stuff we've been doing, it's just we've been going straight webcam. 30 frames a second, whatever the webcam will do, and that's where you get, you can see it kind of blurring in real time, and the telescope is shaking, and you can hear the wind blowing against the telescope, but, but the, with these fainter objects, we need to do a longer exposure to show some of the, uh, the fainter parts of it, and so in this case, you've done a, a 10 second exposure to, to gather light for 10 seconds, and then we're updating the view on this telescope, so... Um, is that and so, what filter is that? Oh, Gary, I think you're muted right now. You hear me all right now? Yeah, that's great. Okay, I have to get a new headset. <laughs> um, completely lost my... Oh, I live in a fairly light polluted area. So when I try to do anything without filters, it's atrocious. So this is um, in the light of hydrogen that excited hydrogen gives off. And it's very narrow. So basically what it's doing is it's chopping out everything that's the street lights, the glow in the sky, everything that's coming down. And I get just what's emitted by hydrogen. And that is mostly for nebulas. Uh, most nebulas are considerably most hydrogen. And then the hydrogen gets excited. In this particular case, let me see if I can spread this a little bit. In this center here, that mouse go is the mouse on? 
Yes, we can see it. Oh, okay. Um, this is the tri triangulum razor? Trapezium. Yeah, yep, the trapezium. The trapezium. <clears throat> yeah. um, and this is some very bright stars that's exciting the rest of the hydrogen. So by stretching the picture or looking at different areas, I can see that. Now I can do it down to here. And the center gets blown out, but now I can see much more of the area around there. Right, so well, this is uh, an H alpha filter, correct? Yes. In particular. So for those of you listening in, uh, the H alpha filter is looking at a very specific wavelength of hydrogen. Namely, uh, if you remember back to high school chemistry, there's the different orbitals in any kind of atom, and the H alpha is the one emitted when something goes from the third energy level down to the second one. If it goes down all the way to the first one, that's actually uh, going to be even higher energy, so that's emitted in the ultraviolet. But this is part of the series that we can see in the visible light. Right, and it works great in a light polluted area. So I can get, uh, I can get something down, and I, uh, most of my shots I do in three different colors. Oh, we've had, just had Stuart Foreman join us. Hi, Stuart. Hi, how are you? Good, Hi, Stuart. good. It's, how, how do you like being in the, uh, in the warm tonight? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's much nicer. I, yeah. wish, I, just, I just wish it weren't so cloudy outside. Yeah, so Stuart is located in the San Francisco area, and he's cloudy tonight. So, yeah. um, so instead of uh, torturing him out in the, in the uh, cold, we, he gets to stay inside. So, yeah. so Stuart, we're looking at uh, the view from Gary's telescope, and I don't know if uh -huh. you've seen this yet, but it's just uh, it's quite a sight to behold. So this is, I'm sure you can guess what we're looking at. Yeah, that's M42. And hey, three. Gary. Hi. Yeah. Oh, M43 as well. Oh. Right, that's the set of three stars off to the right that, uh, mm -hmm. from good okay. exposures, it always looks like an alligator head to me, and the, the stars are teeth. It, and it so does, in, actually. And so you're still doing a 10-second exposure on this, right? I Here. just set it to a 30-second, so you can see the difference when I get a little bit longer exposure. And, and this is no. with your F2? Yes. Mm -hmm. What, what uh, software are you using? Excuse me? What software? Uh, Nebulosity. I'm just wondering if it'll let you do a log stretch on it. Um, I can't live here. I can when I process them. Right now, I'm just using it for acquire, and you're seeing the acquire screen, and I'm just doing uh, some quick stretching. I notice you also have uh, some pixel bleeding on those brighter stars, especially off to the left. You get those little trails. Do you want to explain that to people listening in? Um. <laughs> <laughs> we putting you on the spot. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly what's causing that. And what causes that today. is um, it's overexposure. The way CCD cameras like this work, and I think Pamela talked about this in another uh, Star Party Hangout, is that it's like little buckets, and the light is individual photons kind of coming down like rain. And so when a bucket gets full, if it gets too fall, full, it actually spills over into the next box, and it has a preferred direction, which is the readout direction on the CCD. Okay, and I usually don't get that, but I am uh, going now, for some long exposures. You were doing a 30-second, but that was just too much. Can you actually bring it down? Yeah. Even like a five-second exposure? Yep. And so, and so one thing I thought we would do tonight, Gary, is sort of follow your standard process. Like, let's let's make an image of Orion, you know, and and... Andromeda and you know, all of the objects that we take a look at tonight, and let's you know, let's ga let let you gather the images the way you would normally do it, and then when we're done, we'll produce a photo album, and then we'll we'll put that onto the onto Google Plus, and people can take a look at sort of our, those will be their souvenirs for the for the night. Does that make sense? Yeah, sure. Um, okay. So we can sort of gather all the images that you need as we do a normal observing session, and we can talk about it while we're going, and then when we're done, if you could just sort of process the images and hand them off to me, and then I'll, I'll put them live for people to take a look at. Okay. This is a five-second right here. So I've just started a 10-exposure series at five seconds. And so when you're doing your astrophotography, what's your normal process? Depends on what I'm shooting. I'll shoot anywhere from 10 seconds to 10 minutes. Um, five minutes is a real good number because that way if one is ruined by an airplane flying through or whatever, I don't lose a lot. When I do a 10-minute, I lose 10 minutes of the exposure. 
but um, five minutes is what works out pretty good here with the narrow band filters. Right, but you can do serviceable photos with much shorter exposures, right? Right, right. Th this is five, and you can actually see, let me move it a little bit, and you can see the noise coming up. I don't know if you can see that on the video. Yeah, it just got much grayer. Um, so uh, Matt Schultz wants to know, how much did you end up spending on this setup, Gary? Uh, <laughs> more than now, I make in a year. Yeah, I don't know if your wife can, you know, if anyone else is there to hear. The IRS listening? Is the IRS listening? Yeah. What, is, what yeah. does a setup like that cost? Overall, I've got um, fifteen to twenty thousand in it. Right. Okay. Right. And that was over time, and it was um, a job that I had on the side. And I was able to spend it on it, and that just kind of worked out well. It's been uh, about four years now that I've been playing with it. Yeah. So this is this is the Cadillac. I mean, Gary's setup is absolutely, you know, the Cadillac of of setups here. It's quite an amazing. Uh, piece of equipment. Yeah, I'll bring up some pictures here. You got some background noise there, Stuart. I don't know if you can... Oh, I'll, I'll try. Hang on. You can just mute if you want, and then when you want to jump in. Sounds like someone's making dinner. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so... so now, you, do you switch filters at all, or do you just, you're just stuck with the, uh, with the H2? No, I can switch the filters. In fact, um, I'll go ahead and swap it right here. Uh, the focus won't be quite on, because I need to refocus between them, but it'll be close enough. I'm, I'm doing a binning 4x4 four four right now. Okay. Well, I mean, whatever you need to do to actually capture an image would be great. Right? Okay. So what would you, you know, what would you normally do? But just, you know... Don't spend the 10 minutes. Let's just spend 30 seconds and produce <laughs> right. the best images that we can in 30 seconds, right? So while right. he's doing that, uh, the 4x4 four four binning that he was just mentioning means that this whole kind of uh, image is a grid of individual pixels, but to kind of make things go quicker, uh, he's taking a little 2x2 two two square and putting them all together and making them uh, one individual pixel. So it kind of uh, gives you a little bit more light collected all in one pixel, but you lose a little bit of the resolution. Right. And yeah. so when you, when you bin, you get a much smaller image. It's, you know, one-fourth the size. But seeing as I were going out at pretty much video rates, that's about what I've got right now because my camera is normally 3,000 by 2,000 pixels. So that means I'm 750 by 5 or 600, which is a nice video rate. Right, right. Um, and so okay. now have you switched, you haven't switched the filter yeah. yet, right? Th this is sulfur, which is also a red light, very near hydrogen alpha. But you can see the difference in the structure. We had the hydrogen, this is the sulfur, and now I'll do... Um, so, John, what's the, what's the deal with the sulfur filter, then? Uh, sulfur is not a filter I hear about uh, very often. And it actually seems kind of strange to me that it would just be a straight sulfur filter because sulfur is very reactive. It likes to form compounds like uh, sulfur dioxide, uh, SO4. So I'm thinking, are you sure this is really a sulfur sulfur it's filter? It's S2. S2. Okay, I'm not familiar with that. It's like double ionized something. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, you stumped me. Uh, if it's double ionized, then that probably means it's uh, in a region that's warm enough that it's uh, preventing it from forming those compounds that I just mentioned, the SO4 and things like that. This is where we need Pamela or Phil in yeah. here. <laughs> well, what's your specialty in, John? Uh, I did my first uh, kind of undergraduate research uh, doing just general photometry on open clusters, which means just kind of taking images like this, processing them, and then uh, making HR diagrams. Uh, so graphs of the brightness versus the color of stars. Uh, and you use that to figure out how old the cluster is and things like that. Uh, my second little research bit was more of kind of a background research looking at uh, super flares on stars like the sun. There's limits on what we should expect, but 
about eight times in the past hundred years, we've seen one a hundred times larger than anything that should be. So looking at is that possibly caused by uh, planets tangling up the magnetic field and causing these. Um, but we're just kind of getting a background on that to possibly do future research. So a couple more questions have come in. So Will Schult asks, if an airplane flies through, are you able to remove that particular image from the collection of images, or do you not have that kind of granularity? I do have that granularity, and I can attack it two ways. If I capture a number of images over five or six, I can average it out. So I can put a, a mean filter that says, these five, this area is within a certain range, and oh, by the way, this one's way off, so throw it away. And I get real good results with that, or I just throw it away. You just eliminate it, and there's no problem. And so, and so, when you're doing a run, what um, what different filters do you tend to to go through? You've you've done the H2, you've done the S2. What else do you use? The, just the two? oxygen three, which is what you're seeing right now. So this is the oxygen three. So, John. So this is doubly ionized oxygen, uh, which would also again to get an electron knocked off something, it's obviously going to take some energy. So looking at this image, it kind of makes sense that you're seeing more concentrated right in that central cluster near the trapezium where you're getting off, uh, getting a lot of that ultraviolet uh, radiation emitted by those four hot uh, O-class stars that are right there. So it's showing you different regions of ionization and various things like that is what these different filters will really kind of let you see. Oh, so this is so. Someone was actually just asking this question as well, which we're going to get to, which is what's the the camera that you're using? And so now I guess this is a way to see it. So what is the camera? It's a QSI, comes out of um, Texas, and it's cooled. Right now I'm running at minus 15 degrees C. I can go about 40 degrees C below whatever the ambient is. Uh, now what the cooling does is it cuts down the noise. Uh, all electronics, as they get hotter, get noisier. So by cooling it, I reduce the noise that comes in just from random things, just from uh, atoms moving and that kind of stuff. So this is, this is the camera I have, and this is with the front off with the filter wheel. So on this one, I've got the hydrogen, sulfur, oxygen, and then I've got a clear filter. I and also... And so will you, will you normally go on that clear filter or, or that other one? Very seldom. I have three different filter wheels. Um, this particular one, the filters are 12 nanometers wide. I also have some 3 nanometer filters, which are very narrow. Uh, they don't, I don't think they work as well with my F2 scope, which is a fast scope, as the 12s do. I also have another color wheel that's red, green, and blue. So when I go out to star parties or you know places where I can set up for a couple of days and it's dark, I shoot straight red, green, and blue. So I get real color. Here, I have absolutely false color. Right. Now, when you say that you've got like a really narrow filter, you know, it's not that they're actually that thick. It's just that they're only letting light in from that wave, that exact wavelength, right? That Correct. Range. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and so because visible light is measured in the nanometers, <clears throat> if you get a really so really precise, it's like looking at one exact color, and that's why all of your stuff is is black and white. You don't have a way to sh to view it in color, do you, Gary? No, no, I have to make it color. You have to make it color after the fact, and so what you're going to do is you're going to take these three images that you're capturing, and then you're going to merge them later. You're going to call one color red, one color green, and the other color blue, and then by putting them together, we're going to get that, that beautiful different colors in, of nebulosity. But it's all false color, right? Yeah, that's false color. And because of the way the eye works, you can make almost any color with just a mixture of red, green, and blue. So that's why it's picked. This is, this is the spectrum right here. And the visible spectrum is over 200 nanometers. So when I say it's 12 nanometers, it's a very small part of that. But if you look at this end, I've got oxygen 3 down here, which is in the blue-green range. Hydrogen alpha is up here in the red, and sulfur is also red. So when I want to map them, I have to decide what's going to be. And it's usually, I usually leave oxygen 3 always at blue. And then I'll switch the hydrogen and the sulfur depending on the look I want. Right. 
Right, so the way you're selecting those, that's um, in some ways it's almost a true color image since you're picking the oxygen three from a close color to what it is and the hydrogen and sulfur, probably one of them is going to be red. So again, kind of close to what it is. Not, again, not true color, but close-ish. Yeah, there's nothing out there that's, uh, that's green. That uh, unless you're like talking it. about P galaxies. <laughs> I think we know yeah. what one of those. Yeah. Um, so have you got, so have you kind of got what you need now, Gary? Uh, what I need to do what I'm doing? Yeah. Yeah, to get, to, to, so have you got the data that you need to produce an image of, of M42? Yeah, I think I've captured the three. This is, okay. um, since we talk about how it's mounted, right. this is the camera on the front of the scope. Right, so there you go, camera on the front of the telescope, which is... So that's a prime focus. Which is yeah. completely backwards from the way normally these telescopes would, would be working. So, Roy, you've got, a, you've got kind of a similar telescope, but a smaller version, and you're out the back of the scope, right? Yeah, I'm out the back. I don't have the Hyperstar adapter in the front, so I'm right out the back of the scope. Yeah. And so you're getting a narrower field of view, but it's a much... And, but it's much slower. slower. Yeah. A lot slower. <coughs> so, so have you kind of got what you need, Gary? Do you think at this point can you, yeah. you be able to produce an image for the for the fans? Yeah, I'm just double checking right now. Oh, you want me to produce an image live? No, yeah. no. I was thinking you could just do that after the fact, or you know, if you're if you got some downtime. I thought we'd move to another target. Yeah, um, I'm afraid it's going to take five or ten minutes to move to another target because I've lost calibration on my scope. So that means I've got to go outside. It's not very cold, so that's fine, but I just need to recalibrate it real quick. I don't know why, but I went. Uh, I came up on Orion, and it found it fine. Then I went over to M33, and it found it fine there. I set it back to Orion, and it was way off. So I've lost something in that, in that calibration. Sure. Well, do what you need to do. So... But I think, you know, we, the, the Andromeda galaxy that you showed us the other night was just stunning, so I would love to be able to go back and take a look at that as well. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll slew over to it right now, and if it doesn't come in, I'll need to run out and just take a few minutes to uh, run sure. through a calibration. And look, can you bring up that the uh, telescope cam while you're at it so we can watch it move? I can. <laughs> if I can find so it. I, I know, I'm so <laughs> <Yes>. demanding. <laughs> no problem. I know, it's still cool. Yeah, I love it. This is, you know... Well, as long as we don't have to listen to it. Yeah. So, Matt Schultz uh, um, asked a question. Can you show us an example of an image that you have colorized? We can definitely do that when Gary has a few seconds to spare, but but at the same time, you're, Gary is going to produce an image based on on the work he's doing tonight, and so that should be even better. There we go. So now the telescope is slewing completely automatically... And uh, and he's got a camera to show it slewing. How cool is that, Gary? What's your mount? Uh, that's a C, uh, the Pro, the CGE Pro. When I got the telescope, I originally got the standard CGE mount, and I went with the Pro. Um, I wish I would have gotten the um, BISC software, but they only had the fourteen thousand dollar one at the time. They hadn't come out with the lower one yet. I would, but this is a good mount. Uh, I, I just keep uh, the other mount for um, when I travel. So I have my tripod, the other mount, everything all ready to go, and I just pull the scope tube off. Um, but I only get out a couple of times a year. So Will Day says he's using the same camera. Uh, so Will, contact me, and you should join us in this star party. That would be amazing. Uh, all you got to do is just drop me an email, and I'll invite you to hang out and. You know, it's very. If you can get images from your telescope onto a computer screen, it's super easy to get it into this Hangout the way Gary is doing it. You just want to install a piece of software called Webcam Max or Minicam. Uh, you you've tried them both, right? At this point, Stuart, I think. Web, Webcam screen. Max is way better. It's, yeah. It's way better. Yeah. So Webcam Max. So a piece of software called Webcam Max that creates a virtual webcam that you can then view any window in your computer as your webcam and then project that into the Hangout and it's, it works really well. It only takes a second to set it up and so if you've got a very similar setup to what to what Gary has and if you've got an F7, that would be fantastic. I'd love to see what that looks like. So if you're listening, 
please contact me and, and I'd love to get you involved. And anybody else, you know, I'm still trying to gather. I mean, again, this was another night. We're hoping to get more astronomers. The scene was terrible for most people. And so, but Gary was able to, to pull it in. So. Yeah, and I don't know why it hiccuped going back to Orion because it found Andromeda just fine. This is um, hydrogen. This is a Andromeda at um, uh, five seconds. To get something decent there, well, I'll do it at 10, so you can see what the difference that makes. Now, which filter was the best filter to actually see it visible? Um, hydrogen alpha, I find, is about the best. Okay. Yeah. Are you running hydrogen? Like Excuse me? Go ahead. Oh, so you're running hydrogen alpha right now? Right. Okay. What it looked like in that first image isn't too far off if you have a small scope, what uh, Andromeda would look like without filters or anything, just kind of the naked yeah. eye. It's really Andromeda's best when you have some kind of a way to capture a longer exposure. As you're seeing now, it's starting to bring out a lot of the detail, and I can faintly see a couple of the dust lanes he's hovering over with his mouse right there. Yeah, and you can see the uh, satellite galaxy to the right of it. Correct. The fuzzy other little dot. Yeah, I'm and so, um, and so Andromeda is uh, is the closest, I guess, large galaxy to the Milky Way, and in fact, uh, the Milky Way and Andromeda are expected to collide in billions of years from now. So yeah, I want to get a lawn chair and a couple of beers and wait for it. Wait for that to happen. Okay, this is the focus is way off because I don't have a filter in this one and it sets it off focus, but this is a clear. This is just straight light at um, at 10 seconds, and it's all overblown. Yeah. I wanted to see what that would look like, so. But you can see those dust lanes. That's quite, you know, and that's only 10 second exposure. Yeah, let me let me take it up to 30 seconds, and you'll see what that does. Yeah, but you're still, but it's still out of focus because the. Okay. Yeah, I didn't refocus it. I I turned it back to hydrogen, so we're going to be close to in focus. Okay. It, um, it isn't the best night because we've got the um, Santa Ana winds coming up and we've got the high winds, so I've got a lot of movement in the stars. Uh, when I focused, I couldn't get a real sharp focus. For, for things like this, it's fine. You know, you never notice that the focus is off. Okay, we're coming Gary, up on the 30. Gary, how are you focusing it? I've got the, um, uh, um, hang on, RoboFocus. So um, that sorry, works so, out real nice. So Johnny Bo Anderson says he took some pictures of Orion with a Malin cam um, on a six-inch Newtonian last night, and you can see it in in his profile. So um, the Malin cams are really nice. That's what you were trying to get your hands on, right, Stuart? You've been playing around with one. Yeah, but we couldn't get it. There's some sort of codec problem. We couldn't get it to stream online. But I got it working on no problem on my computer. Hmm. But, uh, but I couldn't get it to stream for some reason. And you couldn't get like uh, webcam max to. No, we we tried it. You and I yeah. were trying it. We yeah, it was like it a, yeah, it was it like was a black. black. Yeah, yeah, that's really strange. Anyway, so Johnny, again, if you you know if you can get images from your telescope into a hangout, I'd love to have your help. So, um, and sorry, Will, that you've got uh, you've got cloudy skies. So if you can, you know, again, if you can get images from your telescope into a hangout, then we would love to have your help more astronomers. This is at 30 seconds. Oh, now we're cooking. So, I mean, I can't, it's hard. We're all so calm about this, but, you know, the reality is this is unbelievable. You know, compa the, the faintness and details that we're getting in Andromeda are just astonishing. I mean... Yeah, I, I can just say this, this is sensational, especially for an online stream. This is just amazing. Well, and that's why I got hooked in it, because, you know, I'm older, my eyes aren't that good, and in all honesty, looking through a telescope, you do it, and you go, okay, I've seen that. You know, yeah. this this is a fuzzy blob. <laughs> it's a fuzzy it's, blob, yeah. It's neat to see it, but I've already done it. Making the pictures, you know, and, and friends go, well, gee, why, why bother? You can get stuff from the Hubble that's 100 times better, because I did it. Yeah. Yeah. I also like this image you got up right now because uh, this is before the kind of development of photography about the limit of what you could get and be able to see, even with some of the really large telescopes, you wouldn't be able to see a lot more detail than this. So kind of looking at this and going, uh, what 
where astronomers were working with 120, 150 years ago, they didn't have all this really great imaging technology that we have today, oh, yet wow. they still figured out so much. So what was that last thing that you did there, Gary? Because it, it, it kind of got brighter, but actually there was, yeah, there. But I mean, that brightened out, is that a longer exposure now? Is that a minute? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a 60 second. And so, I mean, look at this, right? I mean, you can, the, the central core is definitely starting to, to blow out at this point. But that's I mean, you, you can see these, I don't, I, like, I don't know if people could see it on the, on the live stream, but there's just these gorgeous uh, um, dust lanes sort of on the, just below the central core. Yeah. And you what I really like um, is you can kind of see them more off to the up, uh, upper kind of inch on my screen, about one third of the way to the right from the left, you can see a bunch of fuzzy little clumps. Uh, and like you said, this is a H-alpha filter, isn't it? Yes. Uh, so what those are is those are nebulas similar to the Orion Nebula in another galaxy. Oh, are they the ones down below on the on the the second dust lane? Yeah, I can see yeah. some down there. I see some up at the top. They're all over, and it's really kind of a fun thing to think about. Is just how these are distributed. These tend to be in the dust lanes where stars are currently forming, uh, heating up that gas and making them glow, uh, which is why we're seeing them in H alpha. Oh, and if anyone's, you know, if people are watching this, we don't seem to have a lot of viewers tonight, so if you guys want to share it, that would be really helpful. If you want to just share that this Hangout is happening, then, then that can help get a wider, a wider audience and get some more questions. So everyone who's just, watching, please share it. I just want to say that this is really sensational. This is a sensational view. It's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's really amazing. Yeah, I mean, this is, I mean, I guess we, we're we all so calm, and, and, and like I said, I mean, this is unbelievable. When we actually got into a test hangout with Gary and first saw it, I think it was me and Phil with Gary, and we were both just completely, and, and Pamela, I think, and we were just, it was just private, and we were just, he was just saying, hey, you know, let's take a look at what we got here, and we could not believe how good a view this is. And yeah, Gary, is, you win. You win. Well, no, but I mean, no, but I mean, the thing is, you know. If, Ten internets to you. <laughs> well, but wait, you know, let me know when you're done, Gary, and we'll watch his, his view of Jupiter, and, and he'll, uh, you know, that's where you guys win. So it's just... Oh, just, we, have we got one? We it, is, no, we got no. One Jupiter? No, no, I'm I saying... I can show you the ice storm outside. No, your, your Jupiter, uh, Gary, is ah, not so good. Okay, no, it's not, and I can swing it there. This is just one, when we talk about the um, red, green, and blue filters... This was taken at Bryce Canyon, where it's very dark. And this is the red, green, and blue filters. Wow. That's cool. Is that, is that the rosette? Yeah. Triffid, isn't it? Right. Triffid. Yeah. I'm sorry, Triffid, yeah. yeah. Triffid, yeah, okay. So I've got 70 minutes red, 25 green, 35 um, minutes red, green. I didn't, didn't do that right, did I? All five minutes. Oh, 70, 25, and 30. And they were all five minutes as exposure stacked. And you stacked, yeah. So the stacking yeah. is a way that you can get more light without having it spill over. Uh, and then you just add it up. And that way, since individual images aren't having the boxes spill over from all the light coming into it, you can add it up and it doesn't blow things out. So you can bring out the faint details without losing uh, the center part. So um, Matt Schultz asked again, can someone explain the difference between the F2 that we're looking at and the F7 that Will Day says he has with the same scope? So I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what Will has set up. He can post in the comments maybe, but, but as you saw, what Gary has is he has the, t the camera mounted on the front as a prime focus. So I'm assuming Will has his mounted on the back, and by mounting on the back, he gets a narrower field of view um, so he can sort of see things bigger, but it's, it's um, slower. Longer focal length. Yeah. So, it's a long, so in other words, the light is going further inside his telescope. Right. The other thing about focal. that is uh, it's also kind of spreading the light out more. And when you spread anything out, like light or paint, it just kind of becomes fainter. And that's why we're calling the ones that are, have the shorter focal length faster, is because since the light's more concentrated, you get that image being kind of developed faster. God. So, so what do you need to get a good picture to get your your image tonight, Gary? With this, have you got everything you need, or? Yeah, I think so. Um, let you, me. Uh, have you captured this in your in your wavelengths? Yeah, I'm going to move to Jupiter. Okay. You want to see that? So I yeah. just set it to Jupiter, and here. Ah, 
here's the scope slewing. What's your what's your guide camera on there? Uh, it's the um, Orion Start Shoot. The Start Shoot Auto Guider. Excuse me. The Star Shoot Auto Guider. Yeah, the Star Shoot Auto Guider, and it's the Orion 80 millimeter short tube. Yeah, that's uh, what I have. I have exactly the same thing on mine. I love it. Yeah. It it is it is just spectacular. Uh, I switched over to a Lodestar. It's just a, it's more sensitive. Orion's cheaper. Yeah, yeah, I've got that one too. It's just I use it for my finder scope now. I'm going to increase my box size a little bit. I see I've been chopping some of it off. Okay, oh, yeah. there you go. More. <clears throat> All right, let's see. Are you if ready for <clears throat> it's a beautiful sweet. image of Jupiter? Not going to be much. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, this is. I mean, this is great because you know your images, Stuart. The Jupiter you had was just beautiful. With you know, we could see the moons and we had the um, bands across the planet. So there we go. There it is. You can see two moons here and a moon there, and that's at one second. Can you wow. decrease the exposure at all? I can. Now we're a tenth of a second. Keep going, I guess. Yeah, it's gonna. It's coming down. The only thing that I don't like, yeah, see, it's it's getting the there we scaring. Go. Yeah, it used to do that. that no, but now, that. but what's that's because of what John mentioned before, right? So we're that's that's pretty much. So you see how small that. I don't know if people can even see that, right? That's it. That's what you get in this telescope. So I mean, when I said that it is, it is not good for planetary observation, and the moon doesn't look any good either. Right, the moon just looks like a a tiny bright ball. Well, actually, the moon is about a third of the frame. If I said, oh, it. really? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I've done some moon, and that works. Uh, let me see. But if I remember, it was it was completely overexposed. Like you were having a really hard time getting anything in the view, right? Yeah, let me... Um, and, and so this is why when people say, what kind of telescope do you want? You know, it, it really depends on what you're really interested in looking at. What do you want to do with that do you telescope? Want to, exactly. Oh. How much money do you have is the second question. Yes. <laughs> oh, I see. Sorry. So Will Will came back. He said he's a, he has the same camera. He just has a different um, a different scope. He's got an F7 ref, uh, a refractor. Well, that's what I have. Oh, that, yeah, that's what you have. So, right, so that's what Stuart has. So, mm -hmm. so the refractor is, the, is where you've got the lenses, so not the mirrors, but you've got the lenses where you're looking through. And the, the refractors are great for the, for the planetary stuff. Okay. This is, I took the binning off. So I'm getting the full resolution. So let me uh, center now, if, a little Now, bit. if anyone wants to see this full screen, I see if, as always, people are wondering about how to see full screen. Um... Um, can somebody, if somebody knows how to do it, you can post a link into the thread that if you click that link, it'll let you just see the video stream and then you can press F11 and maximize that. The other way, and you should just do this if you're going to watch this stuff in the future, is you want to search for a Chrome extension called Better Hangouts on Air. And Better Hangouts on Air gives you a bunch of little buttons when you're watching the Hangout. One of them is to one of them is to break the video out into its own screen and, and expand the width, and it's, uh, I consider it sort of one of the absolute necessities. So it's called Better Hangouts on Air, and, and again, if, if someone wants to link to that, hang, that uh, extension in the, in the comments, that would be great. I switched to Chrome just for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, if you're going to watch Hangouts, it's, it's good. This is um, without bidding, so it's a full resolution of the camera. And I'm zoomed pretty far in on this guy. That's 100%. The actual size of the picture is there. If you can see, you see the grays? <laughs> That's the area I'm capturing. Then when I do full res, I zoom in. And and can you even get bands on the plant on the planet at all? Or is it just... I, I haven't spent too much time looking. <laughs> uh, I may... Let me yeah. uh, let me take it down as low as it goes. I've also reduced um, I've reduced the gain of the camera. So let's see what this guy does. Um, right, and so in this case, I mean, his his 
camera is just gathering so much light that you take an object like a planet, it just completely blows out the detector. Well, that in the field of view is so so big. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and this, I've been doing this about five years now. And, you know, as a kid, I had a telescope, and, okay, that's fine. And I just got into other things. Uh, I started, um, just decided I was going to play with this. And the learning experience is phenomenal. Uh, the biggest thing I didn't understand is the size of things. You know, well, you put a telescope. You point it at a planet, you see the planet. You point at this. The first star party I went off to, um, I said, okay, I had the... Uh, I had a Canon digital camera on the back of my 8-inch uh, Celestron. And I said, oh, I'm, I'm going to look at the North American Nebula. I'm going to take a picture of the North American Nebula. Well, I was seeing about 10% of it. When I looked at it and I processed I got red. You know, there was no definition, just the chunk of the middle of the North American Nebula. So this is stretched out about the best I can do. And I, I'm not making any bands out, but then no. again, since I'm in hydrogen alpha... I don't know that I should expect to. Yeah. Now, you know what? The, uh, like I said, we just wanted to, to just show the difference, right? It's just that yeah. this is just a, a different kind of telescope with it set up in a completely different way. And if Stuart had clear skies, he would show you um, just a gorgeous Jupiter. Same with, same with Roy. You oh, know, it, they both have really nice telescope setups for viewing that kind of planetary stuff. So Absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. This stuff is just gorgeous. Yeah. Let me see if I can get uh, the veil here. All right. I just wonder if the, if you I, I don't know what's up or what's not if you can get things like M16 or anything like that or the uh, horsehead just to see those those common things that everybody sees, you know. The, oh, I, I'd love to see the horsehead if you can get it. Yeah. Okay. Those other things, those are the ones that everybody just has in their mind. Isn't this and, and also, I mean, isn't just his mount just so ridiculous? I mean, yeah. it's just, oh, you want the horse head? No problem. Give me a second. You know? Yeah, this <laughs> is just. Well, the horse head's in this more or less the same area as M forty two. Orion, yeah. Yeah, th no, this I, is my yeah. controller. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. The horse head. Uh, for those that are kind of wondering where this is, uh, the Orion Nebula we were looking at earlier, if you see the three stars that make up the belt of Orion, there's three smaller ones hanging off. And that middle one, if you look at it well, it's more fuzzy. That's the one that uh, is the Orion Nebula. But the Horsehead Nebula is part of another large arc of gas that's kind of off to the left side. I think I'm doing this right because I think Google flips my image here. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I normally bring up Stellarium. Let me see if I can get Stellarium happening and so we can show people what it looks like. Okay, don't crash your computer again. Oh, that's right. <laughs> no, no, I crashed You'll from lose Google us all. Yeah, I crashed from Google Sky. That's right. Um, yeah, so if anyone wants to start to learn your night sky, the absolute best piece of software that you can install is a program called Stellarium. It's totally and it's free. free. Yeah. Totally free. And it is just, it's beautiful to use. Teaches you tons about what's up in the sky right now. Um, and just gorgeous. So let me see if I can make Stellarium happen here. That's it. So Gary, how uh, well do you know your way around the night sky having a go-to scope? I suck. <laughs> <laughs> I, I never I learned the constellations. All right, so I'm going to maximize my screen. So I don't know if people can see this. Um, I know you guys can in your in your view. So, so here's the horizon there, to, and this is off to the south. And you can see that sort of S down there. And then you can see there's Jupiter in the sky, and actually uh, Uranus is up right now off to the west, just going down below the horizon. So Jupiter is sort of on its way down. And in fact, Mars is going to be up in just a few minutes. Uh, I, I was out for a walk last night. We had clear skies, and it came up around 10 o'clock or so. I was able to see Mars, no problem. So if you go out tonight around 10 o'clock you know, Pacific time, actually, if you're out on the East Coast right now, you, you, if you walk outside, look to the east, you, and you'll see a red star, and that's, and that's Mars. And so the constellation that we're looking at here is we're going to look at Orion, and Betelgeuse is in the upper left-hand corner. That's the red star, sort of star on its shoulder. Everyone knows Orion's belt. And then <clears throat> down below the belt, there's this, this the scabbard of Orion. And M42 is inside this region. Now, you're saying the horse head is in this region, too, but just a little 
ways away, right, John? It's just uh, kind of down and left. If you, if you look at that line that the three stars in the belt make, it's a little bit less than half the distance between any two of those stars kind of doubled again in the same direction. Okay. All right. Yeah, it's up now, and that's a five-second shot. All right, well, let's take a look at what you've got now, then. I'll turn off my screen share. Oh, that's great. Oh, there it is! And oh, I come just... Come on! I, I just started a 30-second. Right, that one uh, down in the lower right, you see another one there. Doesn't that have a name, too, like the Flame Nebula? The Flame, flame Nebula. Yeah. yeah. So, so people didn't think this was going to be possible. They said they would get bored of Jupiter. Well, we are looking at <laughs> the Horsehead Nebula right now. Do you... And, and it looks like a horse's head. <laughs> There's no way I could make that out looking at it. I could never find it. Uh, it's a horse looking to the right. Yeah. Do you not? You don't. There see we it? go. There. Oh wow. Let me get a little bit of contrast here. There we go. There. So that's thirty seconds. That's perfect. The plane is really coming out. Yeah. That is really, really fantastic. Now, especially with the Flame Nebula and uh, the Horsehead Nebula is another great example of this, it's not a region that is just kind of naturally dark. Uh, in, there's just no stars there. Again, these are lanes of gas and dust that are blocking light, which, I mean, you kind of think of that. And in this image, you see it very straightforwardly. But there's been other places where there's been just this kind of black spot. Oh, wow, it turned green. Um, <laughs> and people looked at that and for a long time they didn't realize that there were stars behind that and it was just blocking light. Uh, I'm trying to think of the name of uh, one of the more famous ones, but, uh, no, but, but this, is more the, isolated. this is the photograph. This is not live, right? Right. Yeah, yeah. so don't be fooled by his, uh, his trickery. Right. This, this is the three color where I map the hydrogen is green. So let's go back to the, uh, to the live view. We won't be fooled. That's the live view. That's unbelievable. That is just amazing. Yeah, I've I, this is beyond my wildest hopes and dreams. And so what do you want to do to, to get your image? Gary, that's breathtakingly amazing. Just what you can do there. Thank you. Just, yeah. <laughs> just Thank you. I I had no idea what I was doing. This is just a real quick, this is my setup. So I lift the dome off. That's how it's set up right now. So I've just invited Peter in with us. And if all goes well, Peter has got a view of, a, of another object in his telescope. I hope it's the sun, because it's awful bright out there. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's, he's operating his computer. So Peter, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, Pfizer, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you just fine. Yep. Good, good. Yeah, so I'm an amateur astronomer from Melbourne, Australia, and um, been a, a big fan of astronomy cast over the last couple of years, and it's uh, helped me become a better amateur astronomer, and I now have a telescope in New Mexico, which I operate remotely from Australia. Which, That's um, so cool. So wow. I think you should be able to see um, I've got my desktop up. If I just flip to the window, um, this is the control panel screen. And so um, while we're, while we're while doing this, Gary, why don't you keep sort of gathering whatever you need to get your image yeah. and then we'll... Yeah, I am. Yeah. So it, one of the things you can use is... Um, it, it's a little bit about the telescope. It's a um, plane wave, 20 inch, on an Ascension 200 mount with a um, very nice Finger Lakes, um, very expensive um, Class 1 camera. And, of course, having a remote um, telescope, you also need a all-sky camera so you can see what you've got in the sky. And I, I think if you can see that on screen and follow my mouse, you've got... Um, we, can't, we can't see anything yet. Um, Canis Major... Uh, no, we don't see anything yet. We're still... Yeah, we're just seeing you at the moment. Oh, okay. Uh, just let me change my video source back to where it should be then. 
Apple desktop. You got that? Nope, still you. Hmm. Okay. You're a nice looking fellow, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the thing to keep in mind is, is um, uh, Peter uses, uh, sort of, is actually involved in science. He's a member of the uh, AAVSO, which is the, what's it, the mm -hmm. American. American Association, Association of Variable Studies. Yeah, yeah, and this is actually a project that Pamela is quite heavily involved in as well. Pamela cut her teeth as a variable star observer, and so, in addition to taking beautiful images, Peter is able to uh, to track the brightness of stars as they change in brightness over periods of time and help with uh, scientific research. So you've got more of a scientific setup, right? Yeah, yeah, that's correct. It's, it's a science telescope, and um, uh, we've done a lot of work on some of the cataclysmic variables. Um, and uh, you know, some people use it for asteroid hunting and other such things. So, can you not see my Manicam video source? So I'm putting the source no. into the no, it's stream. still, it's still just you. You got it, and now have you actually selected that as in the Hangouts? Oh, so hang on, in the Hangouts? No, I haven't. Sorry, yeah, you have to just you have to select that to source in the Hangout. Screen share. Ah, oh, yeah. No, you don't do screen share. You just you just click uh, on your settings. So you want to click on your okay. settings and then switch over to the uh, settings. Yeah, there's the little yeah. gear, and then you can pick the different cameras you have available to you. You should be able to access the mini cam. Gotcha. There it is. Okay. Um, Okay, so settings, then we should be good to go. Yeah, so now we see, uh, now I think we How can about see. It? Yeah, there we go. So this is the, the night sky. So for those of you, these are the telescope domes here on the western side of the hill. And we've got, I think, um, Canis Major here. We've got Orion. You can see Taurus and um, the Pleiades. Uh, you've got Jupiter. And um, so, can you can you focus in on that because it's sort of you've just got your whole desktop and that's being crunched down too much for it to be even viewable by anyone. So if you can do that with mini, you can do that with minicam to just zoom in on a specific area. Now it kind of looks like the Milky Way was cutting across the middle of that, kind of going diagonally. But I don't believe the Milky Way runs through Orion. So what was that we were seeing? Do you know? There's a part of it that's pretty close. Let's see. It's still pretty blurry. It's still pretty uh, pretty low resolution. <clears throat> yeah, that's not going to work. Where were you? Where are you focused? What's that? This this uh, grid that you've got. This target here, Gary. Oh, I'm in the um, pre-focus and align mode, where it takes pictures as fast as it can from the camera. So when I'm trying to center it. Um, what I did is uh, I use the Sky X, and it attaches to the scope and it controls it. Something's going on because when I reattach to the Sky X and try to point it somewhere, it's missing. Where if I disconnect and go to the hand unit, it's fine. So I've got something out of calibration, and my hand unit doesn't have the Veil Nebula. So let's see what else we've got. I don't think the whirlpool is up right now. So Rob, Rob Walker is asking, um, how do you join this hangout? So Rob, it's this is a hangout on air, so only um, uh, the people that I invite to the hangout can actually be a member of the hangout on air. And right now I'm just inviting the people who have the telescopes and have been live streaming. So if you have a view of an object in a telescope right now, then uh, it will be, you know, by all means you can come and, and join us. Um, uh, so, oh, and Mitchell Duke mentioned that uh, he's going to try and do a hangout later this week with shots of Venus, hopefully. So Mitchell is one of the astronomers over on the East Coast, and he's one of the planetary guys. He's got an amazing setup with sort of like the opposite. I think he's got an F-28 setup. And so this is the exact opposite of what Gary's showing us. So it's a, you know, this is one that zooms right in on the planets and gets we get Venus, and if we start early enough, we'll be able to get Venus and... Jupiter and even Mars. So, Gary, what stacking software are you using? Uh, Nebulosity from Stark Labs. I've tried the others and I love it. It's just simple to use. 
So I use that for capture and stacking and pretty much everything I do. Sometimes I'll throw it into Photoshop, but I really, I don't use Photoshop much at all. So Peter, I don't know if you can, if you can still hear us. I've lost your audio, I think. Me? No, Peter. I'm oh. trying to reach Peter. <laughs> Sorry, I'm back. <laughs> So yeah, so the, unfortunately, the resolution on your view is just too uh, low. Like you're you're sharing your whole desktop, and then it's trying to push your desktop out. Oh, okay. the, uh, yeah, so yeah. you need to zoom in on a smaller area with Minicam or with uh, the, the consensus among all the astronomers here is that the one to use is Webcam Max. Yep. yep. Yeah, not the uh, not the Minicam. But um, let's take a so, look. So, do you have a way to zoom in a little tighter on what you've got there because it's like I said, it's fairly blurry in this. Well, the nice, um, thing web, the nice thing about Webcam Max is that you can zoom into a particular yeah. part of the screen. Yeah. And so yeah. What, do you, well, what have you got in, in view right now? Well, that's just taking up the whole of my screen at the moment. That's the part of the Rosette Nebula, which is NGC 2244. And I'm just doing a run on M1, which, um, which is the Crab Nebula, as you know. So that, that's a very deep sky image of, um, and you can only see part of the nebula there. Um, can you, can you reach that now, Gary? Wait, you, this looks like the veil. What do you got here? No, no, this is the uh, uh, California nebula. Yeah. Is it up right now? Yeah. Wow, okay. Yeah, this is the one where I have taken some shots. It basically is three frames worth to get the whole thing. So I've taken the shots, and I haven't gotten to it yet, but I want to combine them to get the one big image. So that's something I haven't done at this point, so we'll see how that works out. But this is just uh, this is a 30-second exposure, and this is up here's one end, and then it goes down to the bottom, and I've got it captured in three offset frames. Wow. But I need to figure out how to combine them, and, and it's such a learning experience. And, you know, the one thing... It really is about twice the exposure time that I have to do for processing. So if I do five hours of shooting in an evening, I've got ten hours of processing ahead of me. So again, if anybody's watching this, I mean, I think we've got some pretty good views, and I think we'll stick. I don't, how's your time, Gary? I'm fine. You're fine. Okay, yeah. and and Peter, you're okay too. So I think we'll keep yeah. we'll keep going for for a while. So if you know if you're watching this, if you could share it if you haven't already, that would be uh, that'd be awesome to try and get a wider audience while we're while we're doing it. Gary, um, I'm just, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I just was looking at the NGC designation of the veil, and it looks like it's six nine six zero. So if you search for that on your handheld, as opposed to just looking for the veil, you might be able to find it. Right. I think it's going to be too low. Oh, will it? Okay. It, it, yeah. I'm not sure where Gary's at, but here in, in uh, on the on the west coast, it's five degrees below the horizon right oh, now. So. Okay. Well, the Gary's in LA, so yeah. yeah. So it's going to yeah. be yeah. Nebula. Uh, 6960, right? Yeah. So were you... Okay. Was there anything else you oh, needed to do? I think you just muted yourself, uh, Stuart. So where, where are we moving yeah, there now? We uh, the veil. Yeah, it's 6960. At least that's what it says on Wikipedia. Yeah, I think you're going to be pointing down. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there it goes. Well... It. It's, it's below the horizon right now. Yeah. That isn't going to work. Now, now <laughs> Peter, Peter, what have you got there? That's, That's the, the um, M1 Crab yeah. Nebula. One. M1. Have you got, can you get M1, Gary, as well? Uh, yeah, I don't know why not. Let's see. Crab should be up, yeah. He, he yeah. should be able to. Yeah. Crab Nebula, Nebula is in uh, the constellation Cygnus, I believe, um, which is part of uh, the three constellations that make up the summer triangle. So, yeah, trying to look here in the dead of winter, at least for those of us here in the northern hemisphere, would probably not be working too well. Uh, what's really interesting to me about the Veil Nebula uh, is that it, in ideally, uh, it should be very easy to find without having to use a computer because if you look at Cygnus, it makes this big cross. In the leftmost star on the cross, the Veil Nebula is just right around the star. And you would think that if you would just point your telescope right at that star, oh, hey, there's the Veil Nebula. But that star is so bright that it tends to capture your eye so much that you miss the nebula. And so having looked through telescopes for years and years, I only first saw the Veil Nebula this past year because I had just kept missing it. <laughs> 
<laughs> so Peter, wow. I'm I'm definitely tr I'm trying to get your your view in in the screen, but it's from our point of view, even in the Hangout, it's blurry, and I think that's because you're sharing your whole desktop, and yeah. then okay. um and then and then it's just it's trying to de you know render down, it's trying to downscale yeah. to make it fit, and so it's just sort of everything is getting blurred, and then I can imagine the people who are watching this, it's going to blur at one more stage, and it's you know, at this point, it's probably pretty hard to even yeah. see. So right, okay. I would, I would love to show this, but right now it's just not. There, there's, you need to have a way that just only shows, zooms in on a on a specific part of that window before we can actually yeah. show it. But, uh, but you can try. see the the comparison here between what uh, Gary's showing and what Peter's got, right? There's the M1 at 10 seconds. And Roy, what have you got? That you got, is fantastic. Uh, Okay. I was just trying to bring up uh, Starry Night to show them on the uh, the planetarium. Yeah. What's and so what was the uh, the length of the exposure on this? That's ten seconds. This is ten seconds. Uh, I'll kick it to thirty and see what it does. But I wonder if you've got the brightness kicked up because we're getting a fairly bright background, right? Yeah, yeah. I I don't have the contrast right now. Let me. Uh, Let's get this. I can do, if I do this a little bit, the only there complaint I have about nebulosity at all is at this stage, the adjustments are sliders, and it's very hard to get a precise position. Oh, you can't just punch in a number. Yeah. And uh, since we mentioned the veil, there's, uh, there's my veil and That's gorgeous. false color. The thing that also amazes me is the difference when you map different colors. This is, let me size it. There we got the M1. The, oh. This is my veil where the sulfur and the hydrogen are flipped. And that, again, was taken from here in light-polluted Southern California. Okay, there we go. Let's... Well, he's playing with that. Speaking of the Veil Nebula, um, the part that you see, and especially all these images, is just this kind of faint, wispy, it makes an arc. But if you really had a telescope that could zoom out much, much further, it makes a full circle. I mean, it's broken up in pieces. But the Veil Nebula is a remnant of a uh, supernova. And, and that's one of my goals also, is to get all of the pieces and make a composite of it. Good luck. That is a huge object in diameter, uh, three yeah, degrees. It is. So about six times the diameter of the full moon. Oh, yeah, it's massive. So I'll try to composite it, but... If anyone can uh, do it, it's you. You've got the right uh, yeah. the right setup for it. So that's it. That's beautiful. That's amazing. So that's um, M1. Right, and just to show you a field of view comparison, this is my full field of view of the pelican. Uh, it's off to the side for us right now. Nope. Hang on. Wow. So uh, the North American Nebula, even with this telescope, would take probably five or six shots composited to get the whole thing because this is this is a very small part in that area the north america is two or three times the size have you done much with uh stacking and doing the uh panoramic images like that? i haven't um that's when i said i did the uh, california nebula with the three pieces i'm gonna start doing that right because that I, that is definitely challenging because uh, one of the problems that I'm sure you already know you're going to face, is that there are very slight differences in the uh, seeing, even between those individual images. So you're going to shift from one to another, but when you overlap them, it might be slightly better in this one, slightly uh, worse in this one. So getting the colors to blend that nice, seamless background is very, very challenging to do. Additionally, the sky will have moved, your telescope tries to move with it, but if it's not perfectly aligned, there's going to be the field rotation, so you're going to have to rotate images. So when you see these panoramic kind of composite images, this is a very, very challenging thing to do. 
and I'm expecting it to be. Um, <laughs> although I yeah. do have another piece of software that I use that's called Pix Insight. If anybody's ever seen that, it um, does far more than I will ever be able to do with it. But it's extremely powerful in background subtraction. So if you've got the colors wrong, where the shades are wrong, you can model a picture and tell it to back it out. But you could spend your life on something like that. But it's extremely powerful yes, yeah. piece of software. I think uh, you're Peter, it looks like you've zoomed in here, but a little bit too yeah, much I'm, now. Uh, I'm just, I've worked out how to do it, I think. <laughs> so give me a minute <laughs> the happy two, medium. Uh, and what have you got there, Roy? Is this one of your images? Yeah, that was the, the, oh, wow. the North uh, American and Pelican right next to it. I think. And so that's the full... That's the full hydrogen alpha image. Wow. That's gorgeous. And so how many actual separate images did it take to do that? One. I did this in one. You did this in one? <laughs> yeah. This was done through a 66-millimeter uh, scope, so I had a large field of view. That how long was your exposure on that? Um... Honestly, I can't remember. It was probably about 10-minute uh, exposures all night long, so about eight hours stacked. Okay, so then that wasn't one image. Uh, oh, no, I mean, so you're it stacking. It wasn't a mosaic. Right, right. It was, a, it was a single image stack, but it wasn't a mosaic of individual sections. Um, yeah, so... So that's it. so M1 right Crab Nebula. This is a uh, supernova that detonated about what about a thousand years ago, um, and was visible. This was a uh, yeah. This supernova was visible in 1054 AD, and that's right. it was observed by uh, astronomers and recorded um, in China, Japan, uh, Arab nations. There's been some hints that maybe even uh, Native American tribes had done some observations on this and recorded them. And so again, we're seeing this live. This isn't a uh, this isn't a photo that uh, that Gary's done. This is the live uh, the live view from his telescope, which is pretty neat. Live with a thirty second delay. <laughs> with a thirty second exposure, yeah, yeah, absolutely. We're not we're not viewing it with the, in a webcam the way we do with the planet. So. And what I've done is I've zoomed way in right now, so you can see the stars are starting to become squares, mm -hmm. but you get a little better view of it. Yeah. What's also interesting is. Um, the, this was one of the first objects that they go, oh, this was a supernova. We expect that there should be a pulsar at the center. And uh, when they first tried to look for it, they didn't find one. And they were really worried about it initially going, oh, is our theory of supernova this wrong? This is the uh, Crab Nebula he's shooting at now. It's a little zoomed in. But you can see the various wispiness of the Crab Nebula. Um, so, so James Morgan is asked, can we see M82? He's looking at it right in his scope right now, but he'd like to see an exposure of it. Okay. <laughs> I love it. Sure, yeah, no problem. Hold on. <laughs> I've got into the American, right? As a, you know, and, and if anyone's seen some of our previous ones with Stuart, you know, when I ask a different to see a different object, Stuart just sighs and, you know, warns me that, that he, you know, he might pop his camera off the back of his telescope and drop his connection to the internet if he, yeah. Uh, well, I'm better at the camera off the telescope thing. I figured that one out. I still haven't figured out the internet connection thing. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but even just like yeah. tracking to a new object no. is quite a, yeah, it's so quite a challenge. Yeah, he's got a slightly better mount than I do. <laughs> it's just so plug and play. Although, Roy, your mount was pretty close to this. Your mount was pretty dependable, too. You were able to really track onto different objects. So. Yeah, the, the Celestron mounts are pretty good. They're, they're, they track really well. Yeah. Yeah, I can't wait to get uh, everyone going all at the same time. Some planetary stuff, some deep sky stuff. So we had we had planetary night the other night. Now we've got deep sky night tonight. So mm -hmm. it's uh, but the fact that we could even get this deep sky stuff with Gary's work is just a total uh, just testimony to his setup. Wow. Okay. So it's in there somewhere, right? And so M82. What's M82? There it is. There's M82 and M83. Uh, that's a 10-second exposure. Let me give it a little bit longer. Okay, can you tell us which one is which? Um, <laughs> I could look it up. Is it 82 and 83 or 81 and 82? I think it's 81 and 82. Yeah, um, 80, 81 should be the bright one over on the left-hand side. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you, tar you targeted it for M82, right? So. Yes. 
and it's dead center. It's dead center, yeah. <laughs> So yes, these are a, a pair of galaxies. Uh, M82 is also known as the Cigar Galaxy, I believe. Uh, and are we still in the H alpha filter? Yes. All right. Well, I'm going to be uh, really interested to see that when you get this next exposure up, because M82 is also an active starburst galaxy. It has a lot of star formation going on with it, and that's blowing out a lot of the gas that's in the galaxy. Um, it's, again, hot ionized uh, hydrogen, so it has these wispy filaments coming out of it, and it's beautiful to see in the Hubble images. Oh, you've got airplane? a satellite. Air a satellite. Uh -huh. No, that's an airplane. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's an airplane I'm near Ontario Airport, and I get a fair amount of those. Um, oh, I can see the spiral of on the left. Look yes. Yeah, on 81. Once we get rid of that that airplane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let me let me do a one minute. And I and I know I really apologize to the people that are watching this because I I suspect you're not seeing the same level, or I know you're not seeing the same level of quality that we're seeing. So. You know, I I would be interested to know: Can people see the spiral arms on the uh, on the galaxy over on the left? Because we can all see it in this view right now. So if you can just respond in the comments if if you can see it, that would be that would be kind of cool. I'd be like to know sort of what what we can see compared to what what you can see. Yeah, but I can okay. see the hints um, going. You can, so we have the galaxy uh, M82 going this way, and I can see a faint hint kind of perpendicular to that of the gas being blown out that I was just mentioning. And all of this starburst activity was being driven by an interaction between these two galaxies, which was really hard to tease out because it's expected that when you have two galaxies making these close passes, it's going to disturb them, and you won't have one that remains a spiral galaxy. Uh, and the way this was eventually figured out is they took pictures of these two galaxies in the radio part of the spectrum, and there's this long trail of gas and dust that joins the two. Wow. And, Fraser, you control which is the big picture on That's the right. screen, right? I control the, the horizontal hold, and I control the vertical hold. Yes. <laughs> okay, so don't adjust your television. I won't. There we go. Yeah, so people are saying in the comments that they can see the spiral arms. Yep. Good. Um, so uh, Luis uh, Maria Benetez asks, is it possible to watch the full screen? I don't find the button. If you look further up in the list of comments, there's, a, there's, some, there's two big links that were posted, one by Matt Schultz and one by Jeff McElroy. And if you click that link, it'll pop open the stream into another window, and then you can press F11 and maximize it. And that, that's the way that you can see the, the full screen. So if anyone wants to watch this in full screen, you can. Um, well, it's good. No, no, it's definitely faint. But if you guys can see the spiral alarms, then you're not. So there you go. So see, James, you asked to see M82, and boom, we deliver M82. This is the kind of slick operation that we've got going now. <laughs> All right, now, now for my request, what about uh, M101, which should be uh, circumpolar, so I'm sure you can see that right now. M101, okay. Uh, that was where they, we had that supernova this past year that was causing quite a bit of excitement, which I'm sure it's uh, pretty well faded by now, but with your scope, I don't know how visible it would be. Well, it's still pretty bright. Last, I had a look at it last week. It was still about magnitude 14. Yeah, I was able to get shots of the uh, the whirlpool with the latest supernova. So I was pretty excited about that. And so M101, so which, which one's that, John? It's going to be close to the horizon. It's going to be about 10 degrees, so mm -hmm. it might hit your... Yeah, uh, it's the whirlpool galaxy, which is um, right by the bend in the handle of the Big Dipper. And it's it's face on, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's a pretty classic image we've all seen from the Hubble Space Telescope, but it's a view of the galaxy right face on. Well, the last time I saw the, the supernova, it had a little arrow pointing to it. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty cool. Were you reading Universe Today? Can, <laughs> can, you imagine, can you imagine how big that arrow has to be? <laughs> Whoa, I think it was still... I think we found your dome. <laughs> <laughs> Still a little oh, still slowing. Okay. <laughs> Let's uh, let me get another one and see. It might it might be the edge of the pod. M thirty three is pretty high up, and you can it's a it's a nice spiral. 
Yeah, I may be. Uh, actually, I may be. Yeah, I think I'm looking at the dome. Oh, I moved sad. it off to that side. It's hanging there, so I think that's in the way. So there's what the dome looks like close up. Oh, very close. <laughs> I, I think I can see the atoms. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. What have you got there, Peter? Uh, that's M78, so it's a fairly tight zoom in on it, but um, for those of you familiar, it's a bluish coloured um, uh, reflection nebula with a dark cloud of gas across the front of it. Um, it's a spectacular object and uh, one of the really, uh, a, a lot of the nebulas uh, are red in colour. This is one that's got a lot of cool um, you know, new, new stars in it, and uh, it's quite uh, blue in colour. When you do it in colour, um, that's just a a uh, three hundred second image of it there. Oh, I gotta go check on something. I'll be back in one second, people. But keep keep astronomizing. <laughs> so yes, uh, M seventy eight. I think is not that far from Orion. I think it's around. No, it's uh. In Orion, it's uh, not too yeah. far from uh, Betelgeuse. Yeah, that's right. Correct. Yeah. Um, but it's it's rather difficult to find if you're an amateur astronomer and you're trying to star hop to it, because there's no really good kind of trail of stars you can follow. When we were looking at the mm -hmm. horsehead earlier, I said if you take the three stars in the belt, you take half the distance between those two stars and do that again, you're pretty much right on it. And there's a lot of tricks mm -hmm. to find things like that. It's called star hopping. Mm -hmm but uh, M78 is kind of off isolated by itself where there's not enough stars to really follow to it uh, very well. Yeah. Mm. I star hopped for years. That's how I learned the sky. And then I finally got a go-to <laughs> scope and I said, where have you been all it. my life? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I tried. So you can see that's a little bit fuzzy there and a bit grainy in places. What, what an amateur astronomer would do is take a number of images in each of the RGB channels, red, green, and blue filters. This is essentially a monochrome camera um, that takes a monochrome photo with a filter to, f to select the, uh, the bandwidth of light that you want. Um, and then you recombine the RGB, uh, red, green, blue separately. Um, and what what an amateur astronomer would do would be to stack a number of those images to reduce the noise here that you might see in, in some of this image it looks a little bit grainy but once you stack a number of these images you can get a beautiful color channel for each of the red, green, blue colors and then you can do things like hydrogen alpha and sulfur 2, oxygen 3 as well. This one's quite strong in oxygen 3 um, in the filter. They're, they are narrowband filters that just select about um, a narrow band pass of three nanometers when you're using the narrow band filters. Yeah. Um, Michael Zimmerman wants to know if we have a way to reduce the size of the thumbnails of the people underneath the main screen. We have no way to do anything. We just get what we get. Google gives us what we what it wants. What have you got there, Gary? Uh, M78. That was a 10 second. I'm doing a 60 second right now. So looking at the same ones right now. But I think you're seeing just a piece of this when I'm zoomed into the whole area. I'm at 86%, so I can probably stretch this a little bit. Yeah, so now you're starting to see uh, on Gary's, I can see that dust lane kind of coming out just above and to the right woo of uh, those two stars that you did have. Yeah. The 60 second one, oh, there we go. Did that come up? Yeah, that's the 60 seconds, so I should be able to give you this. Okay, there's, a, there's two reflection nebulas here. You're seeing the one right in the center that's uh, M78, uh, and you're seeing now that dust lane really come out, but there's also another one down and to the right a little bit, uh, which does not have a Messier, uh, which is the M designation catalog number. Uh, but it's part of the same larger complex. All these things we've been looking at in Orion, from the Horsehead Nebula to M78 to M42, uh, M43, these are all part of one gigantic gas cloud. And if you have some 
wide field images not really even taken through telescopes, you can see that very beautiful collection right there. In the last day or two, there was a great one on astronomy picture of the day that gave you the yes. Barnard's loop and that whole area was gorgeous. Can you tell people what you mean by a reflection nebula as, as opposed to an emission nebula? Uh, do you want to do that, Gary? Or? No, you go ahead. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> you get more under your belt than I do. Sure. Uh, earlier we were looking at things in that uh, hydrogen alpha filter. And the hydrogen alpha is looking at the light that comes when the electrons in the orbitals drop down and they give off a photon at that very specific light. Um, so it's a very specific color. But a reflection nebula is where instead of having the light being given off directly by the atoms in the gas and dust, it's being reflected by the nebula from stars that are in the front. So when you have hot stars being embedded in gas, they heat the gas, and the gas is what's glowing. But when it's a reflection nebula, the gas is usually generally very cool, and it's just reflecting light passively instead of having the electrons jumping up and down and giving off the light themselves. OK. God. All right. Well, I think we'll. If anyone wants, I think we're probably going to need to wrap it up pretty quick. But if anyone has any more requests, <laughs> that would that would be amazing. Um, Can you uh, try to ask about uh, the supernova in Leo that just happened mm. here recently, uh, which is somebody said NGC thirty two thirty nine. There we go. We? Which was the first supernova of two thousand and twelve that uh, was identified. Um, which was supernova 2012A. And the way supernova designations work is we go A, B, C, until we run out of letters, and then it's A, B, A, C, A, D, and so on. So do you want to, can you, can you get that one, Gary, do you think? Yeah, I'm just making sure it's in range. Yeah, I'm thinking Leo is not quite up right now, though, is 23 it? 23 degrees. You should oh, is it? it? Yeah, it's 23 degrees up. You should be good. Okay. okay. <clears throat> then here we go. <laughs> Showboat. Yeah, well, you know. <laughs> Let's just watch that telescope magically point in I, a new I, direction. I can't impress my family with any of this stuff, so i got to go with other people. <laughs> well, we are all super <laughs> impressed. I'll say that right now. I, I'm at a level I never thought I would be. I, I'm, I'm in awe at what I've learned and how much more there is to learn. Yeah. Now, uh, NGC 3239 is... Uh, the NGC is the designation for the new general catalog. So astronomers have lots of catalogs uh, where they just kind of collected things, gave them designations, so we could conveniently talk about them. Um, but often things will have multiple designations. Uh, the Andromeda Galaxy is M31. It also has an NGC number. And really, it's probably listed in just about every catalog. So it's got lots of names. Uh, but NGC 3239 is also a galaxy in the ARP catalog. Now, Halton Arp was a uh, person who was very interested in galaxies that didn't look right. Uh, so he put together something called the Arp Catalog, and it's a very good collection of galaxies that are very irregular in shape. Um, so I don't know if we can see this one here, but it's kind of clustering. It looks like it has uh, not spiral arms coming off of it, but almost tentacles coming out of it if you get a nice long exposure of it. OK, I'll go 60 seconds. That was 10. And Peter, you've got a view. Is that that's a view of your whole sky? Is that right? That, that's the sky camera, old sky camera. Yeah. Yeah. There's that's Orion. That's the general right there. area that we're looking at. That's really cool. So you can see he's got Orion there. <clears throat> Which all sky camera are you using? Uh, I'm not particularly familiar with the brand, but uh, it's um, does a good job. You can see uh, satellites tracking across, and if you look carefully, you can see the Milky Way going right through the whole through the center of the image there, um, which which is always spectacular. And you know, you've got fairly good seeing when you can see that in your old and sky camera. So. And you can see Sirius is just at the bottom left-hand corner of that, uh, of that image. Yeah, there you go. And that's the brightest star in the sky. So if you go outside and you look up and you see Orion, Sirius is just down and to the, to the left of it. And that's <coughs> the brightest star in the and sky. And this is at your remote scope in New Mexico? Correct, yeah. Wow, I'm jealous. <laughs> the, uh, the the reason I asked which camera it was is that New Mexico State University is setting up an all-sky 
camera network here in the in the in the U.S. and uh, they're getting a bunch of different nodes online for meteors and stuff, which is yeah. pretty cool. And they, they finally approved my request, and they're going to send me a camera. So I was just wondering what you had. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I'm not familiar with the particular brand. So one one of the interesting things with all sky cameras is because they're they're kind of like a fisheye lens, so things don't necessarily go across the screen straight. Um, sometimes when the moon hits them, they can create artifacts in the uh, around the camera, uh, which kind of look interesting at times. Um, and uh, so usually planes will, will track a bit flatter and go sort of convex to horizons, whereas things that shoot across the sky <laughs> sort of bend as, in the fisheye kind of angle there. And uh, but you can see uh, a bright media, um, certainly the Iridium satellites and the ISS passes look beautiful, you know, against the back night sky. So. so is that it there, sort of just in, in the middle, a little above the middle of the screen? Sorry, the Milky Way? No, the, um, oh, the sorry, in, in Gary's view here, is that oh. the... Uh, I'm <laughs> not sure, waiting for an expert opinion. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking at some... Uh, kind of images of the galaxy uh, on uh, Google Images and I think it probably is because I'm looking at it and it has two fairly bright stars that are right on top of the galaxy and then kind of another two above it. I think mm -hmm. these two, uh, the, the ones you just had your mouse on are the ones that kind of mm -hmm. overlap the galaxy and then the two above it are uh, the other two. So it definitely fits the profile. And so okay, then where is the supernova? It's just going to be too small on his scope to see. Yeah. Yeah. And keep in mind, I'm flipped uh, horizontally from the way the sky really is. <laughs> yeah. Well, every telescope is going to do something slightly different. Flip it yeah. left, right, up, down. Yeah. And each eyepiece may flip it again. So I, I never trust an image to be in the correct orientation. <laughs> the one I'm looking at is upside down compared to yours, but not flipped left right <laughs> really <clears throat> yes and then i thought why don't we sort of do one last uh one last view because I, I know there's a lot of people that joined us late and so maybe we could take one last beautiful view of andromeda galaxy and then and then kind of wrap this up now um <clears throat> Uh, Rob Walker wanted to know sort of who everybody is, so let me sort of introduce everybody and you can give a little more information. So Gary Ganella, he's the one who's operating the telescope right now. Why don't you wave, Gary, so we can all see. There we go. <clears throat> so Gary, you're located in Ontario, California, mm -hmm. and uh, what what did you do for a, are you, what do you do for a living? Are you I, I write you? software. Yeah, how you did you software? afford that telescope? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll tell you the story sometime. Y2K? Yeah. <laughs> I saved my pennies. I saved, yeah. <laughs> um, Lots. So, and, so Gary, and so Gary's got his, his sort of observatory going out there. Now, John Voise, you know if you can wave there, John. So John is, the, uh, is one of the, I guess, you're a PhD astrophysicist, right? Astronomer? Oh, no. I only have my uh, bachelor's. Oh, do you? He's yeah, so smarter than the rest of us. <laughs> yeah, I uh, no. The reason I uh, didn't go further is because uh, I was getting my bachelor's in Kansas. I transferred to the University of Kansas in 2005, which, if you remember that time, it was during the great evolution debates in Kansas. Yeah, and you so were. So here, here I was having a front row seat, getting a degree in a physical science from a state that couldn't even define it. Uh, so <laughs> I became very, very interested in uh, public outreach and education of uh, science, in particular astronomy. Uh, yeah. So now I've gone back and uh, I'm working. I, I got my high school teaching certification, but uh, the state didn't tell me that they had issued it until uh, three months after they did, uh, and all the jobs were gone. So <laughs> it looks like but, I have to wait another year. Well, that's okay. That just gives you more time to write for me. So John, uh, <laughs> John does a lot of writing for Universe Today, and so... That's sort of where, and you also, you run your own blog at The Angry Astronomer, is that right? Uh, Angry Astronomer, yeah. Uh, I, I haven't posted in it too much because it used to be, uh, when I started it in 2006, a lot about the evolution controversy there. Uh, and then I started doing a lot of writing about journal articles, which now you pay me to do, so uh, I don't post that on my blog anymore. Um, I've turned to other topics. Um, 
Great. Okay, and then Peter, you I think we, we introduced you, but you are a uh, um, you're located in Melbourne, right? And you're yeah, that's right. And and what do you do now? You do the the AVSO stuff volunteer, right? What do you do in your regular yeah, that's life? right. So I'm uh, I work in the IT industry for a company you probably all know that uh, does routing and switching, and uh, so that's how I got to afford my toys. But <laughs> the uh, I, I took the path. Um, somewhat less travelled. I had a successful career in IT and telecommunications and came back to my love of astronomy later in life and uh, have a remote telescope now and I uh, work, f work with the AAVSO on uh, cataclysmic variables and um, particularly FSAUR which Vitaly Nuristov has just released a paper on. It's a very unusual um, cataclysmic variable also done a little bit of writing from time to time for Fraser and got involved through the Carnival of Space and my blog artscope.blogspot.com which is double A-R-T-S-C-O-P-E. Um, I work with the ESO and Alana Sandu has got me on the uh, email list for the ESO in Paranel down there in Chile and uh, we, we get a few articles from them and, and uh, tease them out a bit in my blog and uh, regular participant in Carnival of Space. And, there we uh, go. So that's my uh, background. Yeah. Cool. And then Roy, I know you're, you've are you got a observatory set up in Arizona, right? Correct. I have a, an observatory that I built in Arizona that has a roll-off roof and two telescope piers in it. and It's a nice dark... Dark site. Wow. Yeah, but you're located what in Vegas, right? Right, I'm in Las Vegas. Yeah, and so you've got to go and take a two-hour drive to your telescopes. Yep. It's That's worth crazy. it. <laughs> and then Stuart, you're in you're in San Francisco, and you're some yeah. kind of doctor. Yeah, I'm a doctor. I uh, I work in a hospital. Uh, I run an ICU. And uh, but my I've been interested in astronomy for about 20 years, and I had a a relatively inexpensive 8-inch uh, uh, Dobsonian telescope that um, that I used just to learn the sky. And then when the skies became too bright, um, I finally just broke down and got a, um, a, a nice F7 refractor that I'm very happy with. And if anyone doesn't know who I am, I'm uh, Fraser Kane, and I'm the publisher of Universe Today, which is one of the more popular space and astronomy news websites on the internet. And then I'm also the uh, co-host of a podcast called Astronomy Cast. And my co-host, uh, Dr. Pamela Gay, is I think she was busy tonight, but um, uh, she and I sort of cover different topics in space and astronomy. And so if you have any interest in this kind of thing, I highly recommend you give it a listen. Um, and I, I listen to Astronomy Cast every time I take my telescope out. Observing. Uh oh, we just oh, absolutely. If, if you haven't heard of Astronomy Cast, they do a great job. Yeah, it's fantastic. Did we lose your telescope? Maybe, well, maybe we did. Yeah, we did. But you know what? I think I think it's it's time to wrap it up. So okay. <laughs> all I'm all I'm going to ask is uh, so like I said, Gary, if you can at some point uh, deliver us a bunch of images, send them into email or um, or even like put them if you want to like upload them into a um, a folder in Google Plus, and then I'll I'll reshare it, and then you can have like an album of the images that we did tonight. That would be amazing. Okay, I can put them in Dropbox and send you that address or whatever. Um, I'll no, no, take no. You, if you put it into an album in Google Plus, you can upload them all into Google Plus and okay. then an album, and then I'll reshare your album, and that way, sort of, all roads will lead back to you. Otherwise, I'll be taking all the credit. <laughs> okay, <laughs> no <beautiful>. problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then if you have any questions, just you know, drop me a note, and I can help you get that organized. But, but Google Plus is great for being able to upload photos. So, anyway, well, thank you, Gary. Uh, this was astonishing. Just. Unbelievable! Yeah, you know, well, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you you, have, just, you yeah, have great. You have just you've made no matter what we want to look at completely possible. So <laughs> I really appreciate it, and and uh, and I, I really appreciate everyone else who showed up, and uh, and Peter jumping in at the last minute to to deliver some images from his remote telescope. That's amazing. Uh, so. Have we reminded everyone to plus one this so we can kind of get a count? Yeah. So if you if you in are watching this, if you can plus one the stream, um, that would be great, so that we can kind of see how many people were, were watching it, and then uh, and 
right now we don't have this on a set schedule. The goal is once we've kind of got everything stabilized. This is again just another experiment, but hopefully you know we'll be able to to go to some kind of schedule. Um, and if you want to see more from us uh, tomorrow at 10 a.m. Pacific, we're going to be doing our weekly space hangout with a bunch of uh, space and astronomy journalists. And uh, that starts so 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 Eastern, uh, what's that, 6 o'clock Greenwich Mean Time. So we'll be doing that. Um, great. All right. Well, thanks. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap this up. Thanks again to everybody. And... Uh, and sorry, I didn't give anyone, didn't have more notice tonight. But this is how we, this is how we roll with the uh, the live streaming telescope. So, all right, Take care. thanks Take again. Care. Excellent, Take care, guys. All right, thank you very everyone. much. Bye. Yeah, awesome job here.